Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for the um, the Postmasters DMP virtual information session. Um, really appreciate it. Whether you are watching us live or you're watching to re the recording, we appreciate your time and you making time to be able to, to watch this, this video. Um, my name is Tom Crash. I'm the director of uh, graduate admissions here um, at Commonwealth U Bloomsburg. Uh, the event should take around 30 or 40 minutes. This is being recorded. Um, if anybody has any questions, whether again, you're watching the live one, the, the live video or the recorded video, uh, feel free to follow up with Dr. Parker or I, and we are happy to help in any way that we can. Uh, but before we go any further, Dr. Park, would you mind introducing yourself to uh, the rest of the group? Sure. I'm Dr. Lori Park. I am the director of the Postmasters DNP program here. I am a family nurse practitioner by training. I actually work in the breast health clinic at Geisinger in Danville. So I've been a nurse practitioner now for 19-ish years, um, and all of my time has been spent in women's health. So, Excellent. so um, prior to entering the world of academia, and I know you still um, have practicing hours, um, you've spent a long career in, in, in hospitals, I would imagine. Uh, as a nurse, you mean, or yeah. Um, well, yeah, I've been a nurse now for 20, what year is this? This is 23, 24 years. Um, but uh, so most of my career actually has been as a nurse practitioner. Um, but I've been teaching now for, uh, well, what have I been a nurse practitioner? I should know all this off the top of my head, shouldn't I? So I've been teaching now for about 15 years, yeah. um, but I've been with Bloomsburg for five years, and this is my third year as a full-time faculty here at Bloom. It's long enough to the point where you have trouble remembering how I know. long it is. I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm at that point now. Wait, how old am I again? <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> all right, yeah. great. And I know uh, Dr. Park has a great presentation. Um, and again, the presentation should take maybe around 20 or 30 minutes, and then we can open it up to, to questions afterwards. Yeah. Um, let me see. So I want to get the right one. I want to get the one you just gave me. So I believe that is this one. Yep, there we go. Hmm. There you go. Can you see that? Yeah, yes. All right, great. So uh, yeah, like like Tom said, thanks for joining us here for this informational session on the Postmasters DNP. Uh, whether we've already spoke with you and you just want to get some more information or this is uh, something totally new that you're looking to get information on, um, you might be trying to figure out for yourself why the postmaster's DMP, why would I want to do that, why would I do that versus the PhD or just why would I want to do it at all. So um, I need to move something out of my way here. Okay, so there's a lot of different reasons. You might want to uh, expand your career opportunities. Maybe you've been working in the clinical setting for a while um, and you're thinking about going into some administration, executive level administration, or maybe you're working um, in the clinical setting and you already have some sort of leadership role and you want to expand upon that. Maybe you're dabbling a little bit in teaching and you want to expand on that and you want to take on a full-time faculty position in university and you need to get a DNP to do that. Um, the DNP definitely necessary if you want to advance into some higher level um, leadership positions or other higher level positions. Um, and later on in the presentation, we have some um, a list of some of the positions um, that are open to you as a DNP. Um, increased earning potential, potentially, uh, depending where you work um, and, you know, what their view is of the DMP, I think, sometimes. Um, and just improving patient outcomes, um, you know, having a better understanding of evidence-based practice, uh, certainly um, the flow of how leadership works in the hospital and, and things like that certainly can result in some better patient outcomes with that DMP prepared provider. Yeah, and that's really interesting because I, I know when I think of, you know, an advanced degree, I so frequently think of, all right, like, what's in it for the students? Like, well, opportunities for advancement, more money. And in, in, in this case, that is true as well. That, you know, it still rings true. Um, but also in this case, like, it, it's better better outcomes for your patients. You know, there's, yeah. there's a lot at stake there. So there, this is a good investment, not only for you, but uh, for the hospital network you might work for and also for your patients. So Absolutely. Yep. Sure. 
So if you haven't heard much about our program or you've heard a little bit about it, you want to find out some more information, um, you're working and you think, can I fit it into my work schedule? The program here is 100% online and the courses are asynchronous. So you don't have to come to campus. You don't have to get here a certain day of the week at a certain time, but you're able to work through the courses sort of, I wouldn't say entirely at your own schedule because you do have assignments that are due on certain dates and things like that, but you can work on it throughout the week when it fits into your work schedule, which is kind of nice. So if you work late in the evening and you can't get to classes in the evening or something like that, you can work it into your schedule. This says clinical courses are synchronous. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more as we talk about the classes uh, course schedule. Um, there's not a whole lot of clinical courses where you have to go into the clinical setting like you would think about when you were doing your your master's, I would say. Um, but as you get into clinical courses that are tied in with your your evidence-based project, there are some office hours that a lot of students maybe like to attend. Um, and that would be a little more synchronous. Uh, the, the full workload consists of 33 credits, and this is completed over two years. And in that two years, you are going uh, summer, fall, winter, um, and spring. So it is spread out over the full two years. And like I said, it is flexible coursework. So we've built that with our, our working advanced practitioners in mind. And uh, we are CCNE accredited or the Commission on Collegiate Nursing Education is what that stands for. It is a, a voluntary regulatory process and it's a peer review process and uh, operates in accordance with some nationally recognized standards. All of the faculty in our program, we ourselves, we ourselves are advanced practice nurses. So that's who would be teaching you. And then there are 500 required uh, clinical hours. And those clinical hours aren't the traditional clinical hours that you think of when you went through all of your master's uh, degree programs, but more clinical hours tied into that evidence-based project. So um, not necessarily you know, going into a clinic um, and doing more hours above and beyond what you're doing as an advanced practice nurse in the actual clinical setting. And then, like I said, you complete that evidence-based project and we develop that project with you as you go through your coursework. We help you kind of decide on what topic do you wanna do? How are you gonna uh, develop that project? How are you gonna implement it? And then kind of doing an analysis of your findings and thinking about dissemination of your project. Um, and, and I'm sorry to, to interrupt there. Uh, yeah. Dr. Clark, what are some examples of projects that people might be working on? Yeah. Uh, so we have some um, nurse practitioners that work in uh, an acute care setting or um, an urgent care setting. And so one student looked at um, the evaluation of patients who present with a pharyngitis and are they just prescribing antibiotics to everybody or are they actually following guidelines and treating patients um, according to guidelines and doing symptomatic care versus prescribing antibiotics. Um, we had another student uh, who worked in an occupational health setting and evaluated um, use of a hemoglobin A1C versus um, a screening tool to look for uh, those patients who are at risk for developing diabetes. Okay. Um, those kinds of things might be some projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I always tell everybody to kind of try try to think about in your practice setting some practice gaps or some areas of need, um, even before you start the program, so that you we can start working with you on what you might want that project to be. So, is it, it assume that basically the project that the student might be working on is also applicable for the department that we're work that they're working in? So it's not like something necessarily assigned to them or something right. out of the field. It's like, no, what am I like doing on a daily basis? You know, what might my you know what might my department benefit from so that way they're able to take a more applied approach to that yeah absolutely it would be more interesting to you if you could do something um, that's applicable to, to the mm -hmm. place that you're working right now um, would give you a place to sort of do that project in mm -hmm. and um, you know then you might be able to apply it even after you're done um, with the project if you find some good findings yeah okay. great thanks mm -hmm. So uh, this is a list of all of the, the courses that are required. And I, I thought I would just talk a little bit about um, how it's kind of spread out through those, throughout those two years. 
So like I said, you do go summer, fall, winter, and spring. But um, throughout those those two years, the course load ranges from anywhere from three to six credits per semester. And starting in that first summer, you have three credits. But most of the semesters, even if you have two courses, they're split up and you usually run um, one half, one course takes half the semester and the second course takes the second half of the semester. So there might only be, I think, one semester throughout those two years where you're taking two courses at the same exact time. That was a recommendation of our students that we try that and we tried it and it worked out really well. Um, they liked it. So we continue to do it and we incorporated it through most of the semesters. Um, so, for example, that first semester, you kind of start off light. For some of our students, we find it's been a little while since they've gone to school. Um, and so we just kind of get you in with a, a course. The first course uh, is that DNP role trans immersion, role transition. And the first course you take in that first seven weeks is kind of getting you acquainted with, first of all, just our online system. Um, and just getting you back into the idea of, of doing some coursework and, and things like that. And then um, the second course that semester, the informatics and the technology as applied to advancing advanced practice nursing is a two credit course and that runs the second seven weeks. And then in the fall would be the um, economics of healthcare and health policy um, and translating evidence into practice. Those are both um, three credit courses. And then the winter tends to be a shorter um, semester. So you just get one three credit course. And then in the spring, you would have two three credit courses, um, leadership and complex healthcare systems and um, nursing uh, program development and evaluation. And I will say that leadership and complex healthcare systems, that is the only course that you have 50 practicum hours where you would actually go into the clinic setting. And that would be um, work following, kind of shadowing, um, working with somebody in a leadership area. So those clinical hours do not pertain necessarily to your project itself. Um, and we would help you kind of set up those leadership hours. Or if you know somewhere you want to go and, and you know somebody in leadership you want to go with, then you could use those hours as well. What might and that's, go wrong. ahead. No, it's okay. I'll, Dr. Burke, if you want to finish covering the course, I, I just have a question. Mm -hmm. what, what like a normal week might look like for a student who's enrolled in courses. Okay. And then the second um, year itself is really pretty much dedicated to the development of your project itself. So um, that, and you have one course each semester. So the first semester is sort of really developing your project and, and getting ready to implement it. The second, the, that's over the summer. And then the fall semester is the actual implementation of your project over 12 weeks. Um, the winter semester is not necessarily project driven, and that's a biomedical ethics course. And then your final semester is just working on analysis of your outcomes and a plan for dissemination. And then you get to graduate. So when you ask me about a typical week, uh, yeah. what do you mean? So if um, if this is the, the first fall semester, because um, I would imagine that probably most of the students enrolled in the program, if not all, are probably working full time. When mm -hmm. are classes typically held? Like, what's the normal time commitment for a course that someone could be expecting to work on? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I guess what, what what might that look like? Yeah. So, good question. So, yeah. Um, usually, what will happen is for each of these classes. Um, we will offer a one hour office hour each week. Mm -hmm. And so those are the they're all asynchronous. So or the courses are all asynchronous. So for each class, we'll have a weekly module and we'll usually have reading assignments and almost every class will have a discussion board. And so you'll read and then you'll post your initial post for those discussion boards and then you usually have to reply to two other students in your class. So you're looking at three posts for that discussion board, doing some readings and then mixed throughout the semester for those classes are maybe some papers to write or some projects to do. Um, uh, a few projects for each of those classes. So um, most of the semesters for the first year, you have two classes. So you're looking at doing that for two classes per semester. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then when you get to that final year, um, you're working on your paper. And throughout that year, most students will uh, attend the office hours every week because it's a good sounding board to work with other students and kind of see how are they doing in their project? What do they have to talk about? And the discussion boards in that class also are questions pertinent to the project and to help help yeah. you develop your project further. Um, and then all of the assignments in that are pieces of your project that you're writing. Great thing. That, yeah. So career options that can come out of getting your DNP. Uh, maybe you're interested in a leadership role and you want to do be a healthcare executive. Maybe you are a nurse manager or you're looking to become a nurse manager or improve on that nurse manager role. Um, like I said, looking to become nursing faculty or you are nursing faculty and you want to go for a tenure track position. Um, maybe you're an advanced practice nurse and you want to continue to be an advanced practice nurse, but you'd like to have your DNP or you're an advanced practice nurse and now you want to have some leadership component to that. Maybe you really have an interest in help being a healthcare lobbyist, or you are interested in um, some clinical research because you um, want to help with uh, improving evidence-based practice or um, something like that, you know, helping with uh, improving the gaps in care or something like that. So there are a lot of career opportunities that can come out of uh, getting your DNP. Uh, depending where you work, depending if you um, are specialized or uh, something like that, there are a lot of different reports, but the Bureau of Statistic, Labor Statistics um, quotes the average salary for nurse practitioners as $120,680. Um, and we have uh, an aging population. We have um, some graduate, uh, some retirement. So about 112 thousand plus openings are projected for nurse practitioners over the next decade, with a demand for um, nurse practitioners projected to grow about 45% from 2020 to 2030. So just to give everyone a sense, that is astronomical growth. Okay, normally five, six, seven, eight, nine percent is considered to be pretty big. So 45% is shocking. So the the demand for nurse practitioners, is, I mean, this is a good time to be entering this field because the demand has never been higher. Dr. Park, how might a nurse practitioner, um, I guess, be utilized in a nursing system? Um, it seems like, and this is just more anecdotal, that um, more and more feel like when people are going to doctor's appointments, they're oftentimes seeing nurse practitioners or PAs and as opposed to a specialist. I mean, is that, can you confirm or deny that? Is that, is that pretty normal? Well, uh, you mean are nurse practitioners not only being used in family practice, but also in specialty areas? Um, yes. Basically. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I have always worked in a specialty area as a nurse practitioner. Um, in multiple different, a couple of different areas. I've not really, even though I'm a family nurse practitioner, I've not worked in family practice. Yeah. And I think you, you kind of covered this in one of the previous slides is that this, you know, the, the, the value of having the DMPs, it does increase your scope of practice too, right? You're going to have some additional responsibilities that are unlocked mm -hmm. because of that. So. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Yep. Um, I thought of something I was going to say, what was I going to say? I don't remember now, but it escaped my mind. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's not going to come to me. <laughs> but at any rate, <laughs> if you are interested in the program, um, I guess I should say uh, we're Commonwealth University, right? Um, but this DNP program is primarily housed at the Bloomsburg University campus. So we're all online. So it's online. But anyhow, I should say that. Um, but we have the online applica application and things that we look for, a uh, cumulative grade point average of 3.0 or higher um, from your prior accredited MSN program, uh, official transcripts from all of the uh, institutions of higher education that you've attended, the um, graduate level advanced health assessment, advanced pharmacology, and advanced pathology, uh, pathophysiology courses that you've completed. Three letters of recommendation um, that address your practice and ability for doctoral study, your current resume, a copy of your certification and license as an advanced practice nurse, 
a copy of your uh, RN license, and then the description and total number of clinical hours or cases that you've completed in your MSN program, along with a verification from the program director from your MSN program. And if you contact that program, they're usually really good about getting that information for you. And all of that stuff can be submitted with your online application. And normally, Dr. Park, what are you looking for in, in like a good applicant? What are some of the things that, that kind of stand out when reviewing applications for admission? Um, I would say, you know, obviously all of those things, somebody who is really highly motivated, who um, demonstrates an initiative, I would say somebody who maybe already has an idea of how they can make a, a practice change or identify an area um, that maybe needs a change. Um, somebody who is looking for, you know, some leadership change, um, something, you know, something mm -hmm. like that. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then obviously there's my contact information. If you would have questions, concerns, mm -hmm. want more information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and again, this is, um, and hi, Edward. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, and then this is a big decision. I mean, this is this is a bigger commitment. You know, um, this is you know, it's it's a doctoral program, and being that people are also working, you know, while while doing this, um, mm -hmm. is it, it's a big commitment. So, Dr. Park, is it probably accurate to say that a hundred percent of people who are enrolled in the program are probably working full time or at least working to some degree? Um, yeah, I would say at least seventy five percent are working full-time. Um, everybody's at least working part-time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so of the, the faculty that are on, um, that are in the department, what are some of their areas of, of specialty? Is it like, what are some of their research interests and does, does that ever kind of make its way into the courses? Um, yeah, you know, the nice thing is um, not only in our graduate department, but we have folks in our undergraduate department who have, you know, some advanced degrees, so they have some research specialty areas as well, uh, because our graduate department is, is small, um, but we have, um, I'm, I can't have uh, women's health, I also have some um, endocrinology background, um, we have some public health, we have some um, cardiology, uh, some acute care among our um, graduate, but then in undergraduate, we have a whole host of things, you know, some more cardiology and things like that. Um, so we do have a lot that we can help with. And then we have some uh, adjunct faculty with a lot of specialty areas as well that can help with research studies. So what might a, um, so synchronous would be online live time. Right, asynchronous right. is um, uh, like self-guided study to a certain degree. Um, or I guess yeah, that. yeah, but there are some. You know, usually we'll have some recorded lectures and things like that for asynchronous. It's just um, not completely self-guided, but kind of work at your own pace, kind of, or fit it into your schedule where you can fit it in. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's what I was really going to ask. So some of the asynchronous courses, what might that be like? Um, and again, I think you kind of answered that where there'd be some um, recorded lectures and then some projects to work on. Um, yeah, discussion boards, things like that. Yep. Are there any technical requirements? Is there a special type of laptop that people would need to have or is it really just kind of anything would work? I think that as long as you have, you know, access to the Internet, um, you're able to uh, have some way to write papers um, those kinds of things. Um, I, I don't, you know, you have access to Microsoft Word because that's how we need to get our, our papers that we're having you write and those kinds of things, um, not necessarily. Are there any differences in the, the course expectations or the coursework between the, the MSN or a master's in nursing and the DNP? Anything discernible that people might be able to tell? Is it more research or more writing compared to the master's level courses? I would say the research definitely is more involved because you're you're completing an entire project and you're you're coming up with the idea you're developing the research that you're going to do you're actually implementing it um, collecting the data analyzing it you're doing it from start to finish you're coming up with a finished project that you could publish or present. 
Um, and at the master's level, uh, it's not that in, in depth. So at some master's programs, you do a very small project and, and sometimes you don't, you just write a, a big paper. Um, so the, the research is definitely more intense at the, the doctoral level. Um, so you know, one of my final questions, I'm sorry, go ahead, Lori. I wasn't gonna say anything. Oh, okay. um, so you've been teaching for, I think you pinpointed it to around 15 years or so. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite class to teach? Why? Oh, boy, oh boy. My favorite class to teach. I don't, nobody's ever asked me that before. <laughs> at the doctoral level? Yes. My favorite class to teach at the doctoral level, I think would be the, the research courses and helping people come up with their ideas and, and develop them and, and see them come through and, and finish out. Yeah. And kind of see what the results came out to be. Yeah, and I think, it, again, with it being so applied and things that, you know, this mm -hmm. is not just theory, this is, you know, they're taking this research or taking this project and implementing it in the real time mm -hmm. practice, that is, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's a lot of work. And then to finally see those results, and if you get some really good results to, you know, just that sense of accomplishment that you actually did it, it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For sure. So unless there are any questions, um, or or uh, Dr. Park, did you have any, any parting advice for or anyone who may be tuning in? No, I, I don't I don't think so. I mean, I think it's a great thing. The DMP is a good thing. I know what I was going to say. The new goal is by 2025 for the advanced practice, like nurse practitioners and stuff, to graduate with their DNP as part of their degree. Oh, okay. That's the latest goal that I have heard. Yeah. Yes. And, and that goal would be coming from, is that like a... Um... Um, I, it, I heard it at our CCNE meeting, um, that that was the goal and we're working on that with our curriculum revisions and things like that. So yeah. hopefully that will come through. So it seems like this is becoming more and more the, the kind of like the minimum expectation. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and again, you, you know, you saw the, the, the job demand, you know, yeah, it was something like 45%, like we're going to need a lot more, a lot more. Yeah. Um, yeah. so that's great to hear. So um, thank you, Dr. Park. Thank you, everybody who joined us or anyone who is watching, um, you know, watching the recording. We really appreciate it. Should you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact Dr. Park or myself. We are, you know, we work for you and we're certainly happy to do so. Uh, so we look forward to hearing from everybody in the future and have a good night. Bye.